Hi everyone, welcome back to the Testbed 19 demonstration days. This is our second day hearing about all of the excellent work done in this project and how we are promoting fair data and open standards in the geospatial sector in domains from oceans to space. And just as a reminder for those of you who uh, were here yesterday and a bit of an introduction for anyone who's joining us for the first time, the OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium, is really grounded in its wonderful community of more than 550 members. And we work to promote innovation in the geospatial domain through the promotion of open community driven standards we have been doing for quite a few decades at this point and the testbed 19 task that you are going to be hearing from today really is part of this ongoing effort to innovate and promote open geospatial. And it's a key effort for our organization. The people you've heard from yesterday and will hear from today have spent the past nine months working on six different tasks and they've really effectively run a large number of collaborative experiments 23 participants leading them and produced eight different reports so that is i think we can all agree quite a lot to get done in a relatively short amount of time and as you heard yesterday and as you will hear today there's quite a lot of substantive detail in those reports which we hope you will all take the time to visit and read when they are published. And the participants that you see listed here and our wonderful sponsors who you saw listed on the previous slide are really the ones who have done this hard work investing again and again in building a community and in pursuing collaborations. Now, the test beds are an essential part of the OGC innovation strategy, particularly because, as we saw yesterday, they are helping to move some of these emergent technologies and emergent standards, things like the GeoData Cubes, up their technology readiness levels and really getting them into operation, into production systems. And as you will see today, they are also essential for us moving geospatial data up the knowledge value chain from raw data to higher level products and we'll be seeing that particularly today in the first session looking at analysis ready data so as a reminder or an introduction for those of you who aren't familiar with the ogc processes the test beds really help to assess and advance technology readiness particularly for some of our earlier stage technologies, so moving from lower technology readiness levels, uh, maybe as low as technology readiness level three or four up the chain, but we also use them to move more mature technologies even further towards production readiness. So they sit together with our code sprints, our design experiments, and our pilot projects to really advance everything along. And this is an ongoing investment in shared infrastructures, as you will see today, particularly from our Agile Reference Infrastructure Architecture Group, uh, and a renewed investment in shared learning. And testbed 19 in particular, when I was reviewing what had been done, seemed to take us uh, back to the future. Every task that was undertaken in this testbed, every focus area built on topics that we have been investing in for a number of years, as you can see here, and I've highlighted in blue topics that fed into testbed 19 themes that you see listed on the right. So we can see the agile reference architecture building on really more than 20 years of work at this stage on a common architecture, analysis ready data building on imagery exploitation, geo data cubes building on long-term investments in innovative file formats and AI and transfer learning building on more recent, but still at this stage, longer term investments in GeoML and AI. So it's really nice to see this as a accumulation of work by many partners and organizations coming together. 
So yesterday we heard from our colleagues presenting on geospatial in space, really highlighting some of the basic technologies and spatial data infrastructures that allow geospatial tools and techniques to work in deep space as well as here on Earth and connections between them. We heard from colleagues looking at machine learning and particularly transfer learning, really digging into the details of what's going to work for data sources from hyperspectral imagery across to your more standard multispectral satellite imagery. We heard from the very large and active community working on geodata cubes who were particularly highlighting the value of harmonization and synergy between efforts going on outside the OGC and the initiatives that we are running here. So really again showing the importance of collaboration and the broader community. Here today, you are going to hear from the organizations who worked on analysis-ready data, really looking at creating the definitions and the capabilities we need to put the Earth observation data that we have in very large quantities at this point into action, maximizing its usefulness and its flexibility across operational scenarios. We're also going to hear from our colleagues who worked to develop and continue to mature the agile reference architecture, really looking at developing the core elements and structures we need for this foundational geospatial uh, system for the future and looking particularly at how it articulates with the building blocks and APIs that have also been a key area of focus for the OGC in recent years. And last but not least, we will be hearing from our colleagues working on high-performance geospatial computing about the development of standards and interfaces and resource definitions that are going to let us leverage this important computational resource. Again, looking at really modern infrastructures for web-based uh, spatial computing. So we are going to be jumping into today's program. We are excited to share with you a first session focused on analysis-ready data, followed by a short break. We will then hear from Agile Reference Architecture and then have another break and then wrap up with high-performance computing. And we also wanted, once again, to take the time to invite you to continue to engage with the OGC and the test beds and to highlight the upcoming test bed 20. So please, if you were interested in what you heard to yesterday, if you're joining today for the first time and you're interested in what you hear, think about becoming a member, please join and follow us on social media so that you get the announcement for the call for participation for Testbed 20 and consider engaging more closely in the Testbed process as part of the OGC's Collaborative Solution and Innovation Program and our overall commitment to leading the community, convening organizations and continuing to promote the future of geospatial. So with that, I am going to hand over to my colleagues who will take us into the first session on analysis ready data. And I hope you all will stick with us today and enjoy all of the presentations. Ah, much better. Uh, so I gave your whole, the whole presentation before it was unmuted, but uh, we'll do it again. No problem. There we go. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, and thanks, uh, Rachel, for the wonderful intro to all the work that was done in Testbed 19. This is the second day of our demo days. It's taking two full days to really go through all the wonderful work that was done by people in this uh, activity. And uh, so I had mentioned yesterday when we were talking about geodata cubes that there is an affinity between the geodata cube work and the analysis ready data work. So analysis ready data, I'll introduce the, the concept and some of the work that's done before we get to the uh, investigations that were done by the participants in this task. But 
the although GeoData Cubes and analysis ready data have come somewhat from different directions, they really and literally line up along the same axes and really permit the type of exploitation and value realization from remote sensed and other kinds of geospatial data that uh, we, we dream about, we work towards, and the idea is to make this easier and faster so that we can learn more and also that we can deal with you know, the increasing volume and diversity of data that we're presented with, you know, gifted with, but also challenged with. So uh, I'm gonna tell you a quick story. Uh, I was on a panel a long time ago, but the panel consisted of GIS scientists. So people who worked with mapping and uh, geophysical data in earth, centered uh, coordinate systems and remote sensing scientists. And uh, this was an attempt to bring them together and we're looking at some of the proposals and uh, you know, one of the GIS scientists said, well, uh, this is great. This is a really exciting uh, activity and project here because we'll be able to stack up these different kinds of data. You know, he's thinking about the map paradigm. We'll put this layer on that layer and we'll learn more about the surface of the earth. And the remote sensing scientists who are dealing with orbits and uh, swaths and so on looked at those GIS scientists and said, I don't know what you mean. Uh, how can something be so simple to just stack on top of it? Well, both the geodata cube, you know, indexing and organization of data and analysis ready data doing those initial steps common to many different analyses applications and integrations so that there is a common framework in which to do those integrations to put data together and to learn more uh, that's the point of analysis ready data that's the point where the data can be brought together and the investigators, you know, the users of this data also have a common framework and common basis on which to share and combine their work. So analysis ready data is data which is most suitable, most ready to go into a geodata cube, to have that common set of spatial, temporal, phenomenological, and metadata axes that let multiple ob observations be lined up uh, and uh, worked on and understood together. Specifically, analysis-ready data is that model uh, and format uh, <clears throat> and inventory of the information that's needed in almost every analysis. Of course, the trick is different analyses need different preparation. So what, what is that common part? that can be done once and then used multiple times. And so that was the goal of analysis ready data. So here's the, the CFP, the call for participation view for testbed 19. And it has elements of looking at remote sensing, so satellite data, but also other kinds of data. Uh, improve the integration, particularly through data cubes. Uh, and it has two elements. One is organizing the data into the common format, but also documenting, characterizing, and targeting levels of quality, of consistency, of uniformity, for example, over time, that allow those analyses that the data is readied for to be performed and to be formed. Um, at an understandable level of reliability and certainty. So uh, the analysis ready data task, as with geodata cubes, is largely in support of a standards working group. So for geodata cubes API, there's a, a constituted standards working group. For the analysis ready data, there is uh, actually two groups, one uh, at OGC and the same group working as a working group of the 
uh, International Standards Organization Technical Committee 211 working on a new ISO standard 19176, which is the twin of the OGC work on analysis ready data. So uh, this also was, uh, this work has started quite a while in the past. Uh, and it came um, largely, but not entirely, from the Committee on Earth Observation Satellite, CIOS, who worked on the analysis ready data for satellite data. And then in testbed 16, um, this looked at uh, how do we generalize that ARD concept uh, to a wider swath of geospatial data uh, to minimize data transmission, uh, to be able to work with multiple analyses on the same data store. So, and the CIOS view has these four concepts that are continued, that the most important thing is documentation, general metadata, and per pixel metadata, but also requirements for the geometric corrections and accuracy, and then the radiometric, the phenomena, so that you can look at different observations to find the one that isn't covered by clouds or to look at change over time. Uh, and the SWIG view, of course, so we have these you know, call for participation, historical work, and then how to help the standards working group to make progress both in a uh, framework standard, part one, and then for different product families of uh, geospatial data, particular Lee, Earth observation data. Uh, and so a long way to go here, but this is uh, part of getting started out and uh, getting going. Uh, and of course, the simple view of this, which is entirely valid, is how do you take this peering through space at the Earth and turn it into these sorts of layers and stacks that can be interleaved, uh, combined, and analyzed. So we've had uh, four participants in this activity, and the overall goal has been to look at this readiness uh, for different scenarios and ask, you know, is what's included in the CIOS specifications, for example, and what's being worked on presently uh, by the standards working group, sufficiently diverse to cover some interesting geospatial analysis scenarios. So we have uh, George Mason University looking at the, so Eugene Yu was the editor of the engineering report that covered all of these. And we have uh, three of the four who have gotten far enough to, uh, to talk today about the work they've done. Rendered.ai has worked on synthetic um, EO data, and that introduces interesting new requirements for the, particularly the documentation to be considered synthetic analysis ready data. Uh, GMU has a gentrification analysis and looking at, you know, how much effort and time does ARD really save? Uh, and Rastaman has looked at ARD data models and storage. So with that, I will happily turn things over to uh, Eugene. Uh, are you uh, ready to tell us a bit about the ER? I think you already covered most of them, so I don't have anything to add. So um, probably just go ahead with the demos. Well, just uh, tell us um, what, you know, where we are in terms of getting the engineering report ready for uh, public access. So essentially, you know, the uh, central but not sole output from this activity is an engineering report, which uh, talks about some of the issues that I've introduced you to here today, and then has a section from each of the participants about the work that they did and what the outcome of that was, and then brought together with some uh, conclusions and recommendations 
recommendations, particularly to the standards working group, but also for people who are continuing to do this investigation and research into what analysis readiness means and what analyses, applications, what integrations we mean by that analysis readiness. So that uh, is just about put together and uh, so a uh, little behind some of the other engineering reports, but we expect that in, in about two months, uh, that uh, engineering report should be uh, publicly available through the OGC website. And uh, I hope that uh, you'll take a look, those of you who have interest in the usability of a lot of these wonderful, particularly remotely sensed uh, data sources that we now have. Uh, so with that, I think we'll turn to the work on synthetic ARD that uh, Render did. And uh, Matt Robinson is the one who's going to introduce this to us. Uh, Matt, I'm going to show the video for you, but please go ahead and introduce it. If you're able to uh, unmute yourself. I am unmuted now. <clears throat> Sorry, so uh, thanks. Yeah, great, Josh. It's been really fun to work with you. Um, we at Rendered um, have several of these um, synthetic data channels that are customized to, uh, to um, generate synthetic data for various scenarios. So um, for ARD, um, you know, it makes sense to focus on a Earth observation style uh, synthetic data channel. And um, we work closely with uh, a partnership that we have with uh, Deers Lab out of RIT, who has been working on, with, on generating uh, physics-based realistic simulations for generating uh, synthetic data for, um, for decades. And they're tools are um, robust and feature rich. So it's been great to um, also use this as an opportunity to, to ask questions from them and learn more about um, their truth collectors, the mechanism that they collect truth, the, the, the accuracy and um, realistic uh, estimate um, about, about merits of, of, their, of each of these truth masks and um, properties that come out of a given run. Um, and then one of the really big things I learned about this project was about um, atmospheric corrections. And the ARD spec has a requirement to um, provide the algorithms used to remove the atmosphere from real data. And so we um, use that field to reflect the, uh, uh, the, the algorithms that we used for the simulation and are able to change some parameters so that the atmosphere can um, be set to non-scattering um, from when the, uh, when the photons bounce off of some object in the scene on their way to the aperture. So pay attention for that. Thanks, Matt. And um, one of the fascinating things for me has been uh, a kind of a new vocabulary that this uh, data synthesis has also generated. Um, two of those in particular, I. Uh, puzzled me and I really appreciated uh, you and uh, Dan Hedges explaining them. So perhaps you can just uh, mention what rendered means by channel and by truth uh, before we get started. Absolutely. Um, those are two key uh, key nouns we use. Um, the, uh, the, the channel in rendered AI speak um, is a means an application for our platform. So, you know, Rendered AI is actually um, a horizontal platform that can support these uh, th the apps, essentially. It's kind of like an app store for, for synthetic data. And we provide the ability for third parties. We have open source documentation and examples that enable people to just gen build these um, software applications that can be used to, to generate data. So, um, so we have one now that's just called the ARD channel, which is a specific app for this project. 
And um, you'll see in the demo that there's a content code so that you can go and um, access it for free for 30 days to the public. Now, in terms of truth, uh, yeah, we we a lot of our effort right now is around making or is reaching out to people in the geospatial industry. And I've learned that in this world, ground truth means facts. But in uh, the computer vision world, ground truth means um, the the target that is meant to be detected. So um, they do have similar intents, but they come. But they there is there is some nuance to to the difference. And so um, so when we say truth collector, it means something that in the computer algorithms we can extract the. Um, what it, what is supposed to be there? Like in a pixel, we can tell what um, what crop type is is available, or something like that, um, as opposed to what you might traditionally think of is what ground truth means. Is that so? Clear? It's kind no. of the other no. way around. You can say that um, for real data, truth is what we're trying to get at, and in synthetic data, truth is what you start from. Hmm. Is it, yeah, well, working we'll, we'll leave the angels dancing on the head of the pin and uh, get on to the demo. And uh, I hope that people who have an interest in, in this work will contact you and Dan and, uh, and learn more about it. Uh, me too. Have a look. Here we go. Hello. This is Matt Robinson, Lead Solution Architect and Senior Software Engineer at Rendered AI, and I'm going to demonstrate how to explore the Rendered AI ARD channel and its shared datasets. Our ARD channel was built to produce diverse datasets in a format that conforms to the CEOS Analysis Ready Data Land Surface Reflectance Standard. We built this channel as part of the OGC Testbed 19 initiative. Metadata is at the heart of ARD standards. And so it is critical that generated data sets strictly adhere to the meaning of each metadata entry. I will show that the data sets generated by Rendered AI's ARD channel supply meaningful metadata such as geolocation, time of day, cloud shadow, atmospheric correction, and more. Rendered AI is a platform for synthetic data applications or channels designed to generate data sets for training computer vision models, validating computer vision models, or validating sensor specifications. I will start by showing how dataset diversity is controlled by configuring simulation runs with a rendered AI graph, and then we'll take a look at the results and metadata required by the ARD standard. When you sign up with rendered AI, you can pre-populate your account with content and a running channel by using the content code mechanism. Here is what your account will contain if you use the content code ARD. I will end this demo with instructions on how to get the rendered AI ARD channel and content. There are two graphs named for their use case. One will generate data sets of an industrial plant at 75 centimeter resolution, the other data sets of a suburb at 1.25 centimeter resolution. Opening the industrial 75 centimeter graph, we see from the tooltip that any job based on this graph will generate data for Trona, California and the center of the scan will be randomized. The high resolution Earth observation platform is configured to fly at a random time of day, and any given run will choose from a pool of atmospheric models at various times of year, aerosols, and visibilities. The preview feature will do a single run of the graph to give a sense for what can happen. You can edit these parameters to create datasets with different properties. For example, I'll create a data set focused on high visibility winter atmospheric conditions. I stage the graph, thereby making a fixed snapshot or a version that can be referred back to in ML pipelines. From the jobs manager pane, I can give the data set a name that reflects the changes. You can set the number of runs desired for this job and kick it off.
here in the GUI, you can see the job's properties and how many runs are taking place simultaneously. Different subscription levels come with different entitlements. To download a dataset, go to the Libraries pane. This is where the completed jobs can be accessed. For any dataset, there are 10 sample previews and various metrics. Select the dataset of interest and download the zip archive. Let's take a look at the industrial 75 centimeter dataset. There are three folders for images, metadata, and pixel masks, along with the source NV radiance data files. While the RGB images allow users to take a look at the data, in practice, the NV data cubes are usually converted to geotiffs with various tools like GDAL Translate. Each data cube has an associated truth file that contains ground truth pixel level masks. To comply with the ARD spec, each image in the dataset must have a machine readable metadata file, a measurement of the surface reflectance, also known as atmospheric corrections, and several pixel level masks. The metadata files are in JSON format, and as you can see, all the required collection information is provided. The geolocation and area of the digital twin scene, the collection time, the coordinate reference system, map projection, instrument details, and so forth. To generate radiance cubes that measure the surface reflectance for atmospheric corrected imagery, we do a second run of the ARD channel, but where atmospheric corrections are not simulated for light that bounces off something in the scene. These are stored in the NV file with removed atmosphere in the name. These contain the radiance measurements of each band in the sensor. With synthetic data, pixel level masks are much easier to come by than for real data. The ARD channel is based on version 5 of DIRSIG, RIT's Digital Imaging and Remote Sensing Image Generation Simulation Tool. DIRSIG is a physics-based, radiometrically accurate simulator ideal for generating low-level, multispectral Earth observation and aerial imagery with sub-pixel ground truth annotations. For descriptions of all the pixel level metadata given in the data sets of this channel, see the online documentation for DIRSIG truth collectors. One of the benefits of using synthetic data that meets the ARD standard is the vast amount of ground truth. Each run of the rendered AI ARD channel contains the properties listed here. Going back to our industrial 75 centimeter data set, we see a few ground truth masks are extracted at runtime to give users a sense for the per pixel metadata. The dominant material index indicates which material contributes most to each pixel and empty pixels. For example, soil, grass, water, ice, and snow. The sky fraction estimates the fraction of the sky illuminating the pixel, a good indicator of cloud shadow. The sun exposure mask is an estimate of the fraction of the pixel that is in direct sun. And finally, the view angle cosine is an estimate of the per pixel average cosine of the surface normal versus the view vector. Taking a look at the suburban 1.25 centimeter dataset, you see the same metadata structure for each run, including a parallel run for atmosphere removal. Again, these are simulations of the scenario where the measured pixel values for each sensor band represents the surface leaving radiance rather than the aperture receiving radiance, a key focus of the ARD standard. To get the ARD channel, sign up at Rendered AI and enter the content code ARD. If you want to learn more about how to run the channel and generate data, you can check out our support doc and also make sure to look at the SDK documentation to learn how you can integrate this data into your ML pipeline. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rendered, and thanks, Matt. Um, anything more you want to add on it? And also, uh, let me remind people that we have a Q&A channel, and the participants 
uh, who are presenting today and representing their organizations are standing, well, at least sitting, ready to answer your questions. Uh, so please feel free to uh, enter them in the Q&A channel or, or follow up with us. We can put you in touch with uh, the participants uh, for uh, further inquiries uh, following the session. But the Q&A channel is available right now. So please go ahead if you're interested. Thanks very much, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Josh. I'll keep an eye on the chat. So uh, next, we're going to turn to back to GMU. And uh, so GMU worked on the engineering report, but also worked on their own scenario for the use and evaluation of uh, analysis-ready data. So I'm going to cue that up. And uh, Eugene, if you'd like to introduce that. Uh, yes. Um... I think uh, this uh, this job job is mostly done on the area which is uh, in Washington D Washington D.C. area, looking at the gentrification uh, analysis to for that for that area using a uh, time series of uh, mostly the land site data as a base and also incorporate some of those uh, um, other um, data from other sources like uh, building information and also their uh, building planning. Those are the information will be incorporated in the, into the analysis. And uh, those are, on, I think, I think um, during the process, we, we, we have identified like a three technical or sort of uh, recommendation or challenges which we face in using those uh, analysis ready data. So please go ahead, play the really, uh, demonstration and in the demonstration or explain those uh, uh, limitations. Thanks. Great, thank you. And uh, here we This is the final demo for two deliverables, D182 Python package to access the HPC API and D183 demo Jupyter notebooks. Both have been completed by a GMU team, including Dr. D, Dr. Lin, and Dr. Yu. For Are you sure? Sorry. Is that the, the one? I think this is yes. the other one, right? Yeah. You'll get to see that one later, but let's do the one um, with GMU work for ARD here. Hello everyone, this is a demonstration video for OGC test bed 19, Analyze Ready Data Threat, Task D151 ARD Demonstration Scenarios. My name is Li and I'm presenting for our team at the Center for Spatial Information Science and Systems at Georgia Mason University. The Center for Spatial Information Science and Systems, CSRSS, is an interdisciplinary research center at Georgia Mason University. The center is a member of the National Committee on Information Technology Standards Technical Committee and a member of the Open Geospatial Consultants. The developer teams for this task include myself, Dr. Zhang, Dr. Hao, and Dr. Yu. These are a few pictures we took during the test bed kickoff event last year at Philadelphia, showing the local neighborhoods was trying to fight against displacement due to the gentrification. This is happening at every city around the world all the time. Gentrification is a phase often defining a process that transforms a city neighborhood from low value to high value rapidly in a relative short period of time, for example, in a few years, often as a result of urban renewal programs. A typical gentrification monitoring and mapping with EO data involves a long workflow from the EO data discovery, data access, radiometric and geometric corrections, data assembly such as projections and subsetting, and data analysis. The readily available ARD datasets can significantly improve the research efficiency and shorten the workflow by reducing the pre-processing needed before the analysis 
and the machine learning can improve the identification of gentrification using satellite imagery. This is the overview of the threat tasks. For our task, we are mainly using gentrification as our scenario scene and evaluate how ARD has changed and improved the process of gentrification mapping and monitoring. We are trying to understand how ARD can help saving the process in time in such use case. The data used in this study is Landsat ARD. The data was downloaded through the USGS Earth Explorer portal, and we have used ArcGIS Pro to pre-process the data for extracting pixels intersect with the actual building footprints. This is one of the Google Earth time series chains of the National Park in Washington, D.C., showing you how the changes can be seen from the satellite observations. Combined with other invisible bands carried by Landsat mission, it is one of the very efficient ways for detecting land use and cover change, especially for urban areas. Again, this is how building-related pixels are extracted during the pre-processing process, and the right images are showing you the time series of Landsat ARD for one sample pixel. And we have used a method to smooth the time series for removing low-quality pixels, such as covered by cloud. In this work, we evaluate multiple predefined machine learning tools in ArcGIS, showing that the standard machine learning algorithms are ideal for most use cases, such as monitoring gentrification. In addition, the pre-processed ARD datasets allowed for immediately interoperability and comparison in time series. It indeed saved time for pre-processing data from different satellites. And of course, we have documented our study in the engineering report and provided our recommendation to the OGC ISO ARD standard working group. This slide summarized our recommendations. First, the quality assurance band for different satellites use different encodings to represent different quality, meaning such metadata is not yet ARD ready. Another area for improvement was metadata in capability with ArcGIS software, which supported the specific Landsat satellites, but not the ARD yet. We hope Israel will address this in the near future. Lastly, we recommend that all users should be able to access ARD through a data cube-like format, especially in our scenario, which prepare ARD for machine learning-ready training datasets. This recommendation was also mentioned in the Climate Resilience Pilot Engineering Report. Analyze Ready Data Cube, ARDC, can be an important in pre-processing big data which will make ARD more accessible and easier to use. This is the references for our study. Thank you and please feel free to contact us if there's any questions or comments. Thank you for uh, GMU, uh, that work and the presentation. Uh, let me check. Uh, Eugene, any further thoughts? All right. Uh, I think, so, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that's a uh, the, the, the discussion already covered most of them. Uh, all of them. I think so. One of the major, uh, I think, uh, major things is uh, because those are uh, not ready data, they are not they. They label them as uh, less ready data, but they are still have some inconsistency on the metadata um, declaration. And also um, some of those metadata is not picked up by the um, popular GIS software, which is like uh, ArcGIS, so not, not recognize those uh, metadata information, which really push, uh, put the request on the standardize those things and also make those standards available for those uh, commercial software or open source software, uh, just software to implement those support, relevant support so they can readily use those uh, um, unless ready data. 
And uh, uh, so another thing is uh, uh, for this uh, um, scenario, we are focusing on the um, using utilizing this time series of data. We have a re special request which we can we need to uh, retrieve the time series at uh, up to the pixel level to do the analysis. So uh, the current uh, uh, services with those or analysis ready data, especially those data providers so that don't provide those um, those are capability or easily allow you to retrieve those data without retrieving the whole thing. <laughs> and then the, this is probably were adapted to the um, another standard, which is currently in, in developing the, the first uh, data cube, which can prepare those uh, temperatures and the stack mechanism ready for um, more dynamically and uh, a sub subset on those things or to substantially retrieve those time series. That's where um, I think uh, that's one of the recommendations from this uh, study. I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, and again, uh, there is the Q&A channel, so you can ask questions of uh, Eugene uh, or any of the other participants uh, and look for further information. So with that, uh, let me turn to our next uh, participant and presenter, uh, which is Raz Daman. And uh, I think Peter Baumann is going to uh, talk about this work. And I will pull up these uh, slides to do so. There. Yep. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Josh, for introducing us. The team here from Rastaman consists of Dimitar Mijev and myself, Peter Baumann, and I'm lead us through the slides here. So uh, let's go to the next slide, please, which jumps right into the matter. Uh, we have done demonstrations and uh, I will come back to the video in the end, but this one uh, stands out in that it is more of a conceptual work. So it is commonly recognized that analysis readiness is a critical feature of data and processing standards, and therefore it has gained much attention recently in OGC, in ISO, and in other bodies. Actually, personally, I prefer a word like consumption ready because it's not about analysis only. It's about any way of using data. Okay, uh, when it comes to raster data or when it comes to data cubes for that matter, then actually with a coverage concept and the set of standards, we have a solid starting point where there is already something like we have a range type definition in coverages, uh, which describes the semantics of the pixels or voxels. So the central research question was, how far does that carry us already uh, with respect to ARD and what needs to be added? Uh, we have two deliverables here as part of the logic of testbed 19, that is data cubes that have been built up with Rustaman encompassing 32 terabytes local, uh, plus then actually that is too low, it's three petabytes of data uh, that are federated transparently into this service. Plus there is the engineering report and uh, this ARD report had also been submitted uh, to journal. And I would like to gratefully acknowledge the support by Testbed 19, by OGC and the sponsors, and by European funded project FairyCube. Next slide, please. Okay, so analysis readiness. What does it mean actually? There's a lot of discussion around it and many concepts are floating around and uh, no solid definition as such, which tells us the field is young and still maturing. Uh, therefore, for this study, three scenarios have been picked as uh, use cases uh, to investigate how far are we. The first one is, let's say, a warm-up exercise, service quality parameters. How much are they available with the coverage definitions? 
okay in the domain so where are the data uh, we can decide whether spatial temporal resolution is sufficient for a particular purpose can I understand the coordinate reference system etc that is in the coverage metadata that is present that is good with a range type, we learn about the unit of measure, and I can ask myself, is that a unit that I know and that I can convert, like feet to meters? Uh, what about the accuracy of data? What about nil values, also stored as metadata, and that is available? With the range values, actually, we now really drill into the data. We can find out, for example, are there sufficient non-null values in the area of interest? So, for example, cloud-free. This is where we drill into the data. In the engineering report, we have laid down how far that is sufficient, and we also spotted places where things are missing. I will come to that on the next slide. We are still in overview mode. The next scenario was about coverage fusion, that is, combination of two random independent coverages and doing that automatically, so without humans massaging the data so that they fit together. Here's an example expressed in WCPS, where we have two coverages A and B, which we want to combine doing some pixel arithmetics. Okay, obviously some conditions have to hold here. They have to have the same extent. The pixel types must be compatible so that we can do A minus B. Uh, they need to be in the same coordinate system, plus several more. And if that is not the case, then it needs to be homogenized. And we are talking about that automatically. So that is the requirement here. And the third scenario was about machine learning, where actually we can embed that. With this WCPS query, you see uh, some extension that allows prediction using some model that is passed as a parameter. But then actually, as we all know, such models have varying mileage in terms of accuracy, in terms of reliability. So here the challenge is, how can we automatically ensure uh, minimum confidence so that this really can be applied, for example, in an automatic process where no human is holding hands? Okay, next slide, please. Based on these three analysis scenarios, uh, we have looked where do we stand, what can coverages do, and what is missing. So the good thing is essential metadata get enforced and they are guaranteed available and in defined structures. You see some screenshots here from our clients which disentangle the XML metadata or JSON metadata and put them into something readable. So that is available and uh, up to nil values we have such things here. But then the problems start. Yes, we have a slot for units of measure but the contents, the syntax, is not normatively fixed. So we have URLs, for example, but what does that URL want to express? There is UCOM, there is QUDT uh, as approaches to semantically model that, and also OGC has started on a registry. This is something that should be normatively fixed so that we come to an automatic conversion. Then, if you want to have quality guarantees that are not fixed and hardwired, but that are defined ad hoc by an application, that is difficult currently. Related to that, fitness for purpose, and there is uh, the thing, interpolation is mentioned. So we know what interpolation techniques are uh, applicable to a particular coverage. It knows about that, but for example, summarizability. Land use data, we cannot summarize. You cannot do the average of land and water. So this is something where definitely extensions are needed. And then finally, another class of issues arises from too much technicalities. Still, standards need too much technical knowledge. Like for example, tiling. This is really just an implementation detail and users couldn't care less, but sometimes they are required to know about that. This is a hurdle. Actually, if you look at that, some of these issues are specific to coverages, others are not. And therefore, it makes sense to look for a consultation so that we are going beyond coverages and do some OGC-wide discussion and agreement finally so that we can cast that into standards or at least best practices. This refinement actually might be something for testbed 20. Let us see. Next slide, please. So, uh, with the next and final slide, thanks, Josh. Uh, short summary. 
Uh, there is indeed some need for work on ARD standardization, and that addresses both the data modeling and the processing modeling. Uh, we can define metadata compartments because we have metadata from different sources in our coverages. Uh, we need to think about units of measure, as I have mentioned. QDT seems to be a good candidate here, which maybe OGC could adopt as a community project. I don't know. Uh, fitness negotiation is something that should be elaborated so that a client can say what it really wants in terms of quality, and then the server can decide whether it can fulfill that. Summarizability is something to be investigated. Statistics has a body of knowledge here that can be exploited. We want to avoid undue technicalities. And finally, <coughs> excuse me, something more strategic. There are standards that have overlaps. That's not bad per se, but incompatible overlaps. And that is not good. To have standards that are competing and incompatible in OGC is not exactly fostering interoperability. So in summary, coverages have some ARD mileage already, but there is further work necessary. And the good news is I believe that non-breaking enhancements are possible. For further details, I'm happy to stay available here for discussion, but see also our engineering reports and also see our demos at testbed19.rustermen.com. Thank you for your attention and handing back to Josh. Thank you, Peter. Um, very nice exposition of a number of the issues with analysis readiness and analysis ready data. Um, I've particularly appreciated your uh, perspective that it's necessary but not sufficient to organize and characterize data to be analysis ready, but that machine readability is a really important part of any savings in time and you know uh, enforcement of fitness that analysis ready data can achieve. So we appreciated uh, those contributions from Rastaman. And uh, I invite people to uh, put questions in the Q&A channel um, for Peter to answer. So uh, turning to our uh, next uh, participant and next scenario, uh, I'm gonna show some slides where uh, Glenn Laughlin of uh, Pelagis uh, talks about work that he's done that's overlapped uh, the uh, kind of uh, fundamental research and development that's represented in the test bed and a very much domain specific um, uh, environmental and climate science that was done by Pelagius in the marine pilot and other activities. So, you know, we're always trying to connect the dots here with technical capabilities, um, standards development, and actual improved understanding and uh, shared knowledge of the uh, world that we live in. And uh, so I think this is a good example of it. Also, a good example of the, the challenges that uh, come up when you're dealing with real data. And uh, we might call real ground truth. I, I don't know what how to use the terms anymore. Um, I will mention that uh, you know we got some good questions about you know synthesis and AI models and uh, you know what is the truth? How do we characterize it? Um, how do we approach it? How do we tell how far away we are from it? Uh, and so uh, we try to keep in mind that you know our our ultimate goals here are better understanding uh, these are all tools and mechanisms to achieve and share that uh, knowledge so with that I'm going to uh, let's see share this properly there we go okay uh, got your slides up here Glenn so um, I turn things over to you. I think, uh, yeah, yeah we go. got it. There we go. 
Uh, thanks, Josh. I appreciate the uh, the support that you and everyone else on this team has provided to me uh, on this project. Um, I come at this from a completely different angle. I don't have a lot of experience in Earth observation science. Um, I come more from the, the ground-based observation system, so coming with a telecom background in IoT. Um, so I co-chair the Marine Domain Working Group on behalf of OGC and actively involved in some of the uh, standards working groups, primarily around observation systems. Um, go ahead. Sorry. Next slide. Yeah, we can just kind of roll through. So just give you a quick overview of what we've been working on within the OGC and the Marine Domain Working Group. Um, each year, over the last few years at least, we, we've been hosting various pilots sponsored through um, initiatives through NRCAN as an example, or the UK IHO initially started uh, looking at marine protected areas and um, the effects on the ecosystems uh, around certain ones in the Baltic region, everything from vessel traffic uh, to changing ocean conditions and variables, which led us into testbed 18. And testbed 18, we focused on observation systems where the observable moves in space and time. So in this case, um, as an example, the sail drone program through NOAA, um, where we're getting um, sea surface temperatures and near surface air temperatures from drones um, that move around on the ocean top. Um, and then coupling that in with human activity again, with vessel traffic and hurricane tracking. So taking a look at the dynamics of what's happening out in the marine environment, especially as it affects um, our use of these shared resources. The climate change resilience program um, was interesting because that was really my first introduction to the use of EO as a supplement um, to the ground-based observation systems that we typically use. And um, it was interesting because I previously worked on behalf of the aquaculture group here in Nova Scotia um, on studies around pathogens, pathogens being introduced into our waters that haven't been here before, and trying to tie that back to um, the effects of climate change as an example. So we've deployed sensors in the water that take um, you know, time series measurements of salinity and, and temperatures and what have you. But the challenge there has always been, what about the data we don't have? Where can we get data uh, that can complement or fill in the gaps? so that we have a better picture of what's happening on a regional basis um, and trying to work with the scientists and researchers here um, in, out of the college and universities at least um, to understand that cause and effect. And so the more recent um, pilot we did with the Marine Domain Working Group was a digital Arctic program sponsored again through NRCAN. Next slide. <clears throat> So the Digital Arctic, we were looking at it more from an ecosystem standpoint. Um, so Intercan is a big sponsor of the Arctic Council, uh, which is probably now a seven member. There's a certain country that it's no longer uh, active, we'll put it that way, that is part of the Arctic Council. Um, but what we were looking at again is how do we combine sampling programs that are um, specific to the Arctic region and combine that with Earth observation data. So usability and discovery uh, were really important to the research scientists. Um, we have good sampling programs, but it's dispersed, if you will. So how do we derive coverages of you know, the essential climate variables that can be derived through Earth observation systems? Next slide. So that project was my first introduction to the concept of multidimensional data, um, especially over space and time. And we were looking at both the, the X and Y and the elevation, but bathymetry is really important to the dynamics <clears throat> and the effects on ecosystems. Next slide. <clears throat> and the Arctic SDI program itself supports a number of sampling programs with a focus on ecosystem variables and biodiversity variables. And our challenge in that case was how do we introduce um, the ECVs and essential ocean variables and, and tightly couple those various systems and observation systems, um, really to give more information to the research scientists with, again, that cause and effect uh, issue. Next slide. <clears throat> So 
So in that program, um, we focused in on the effect of sea ice height. So sea ice being an essential uh, uh, variable uh, for the digital for an Arctic and tying that back to biodiversity indicators. Um, so again, having good sampling programs and, and observation networks supported through GeoBond as an example, and trying to draw relationships, spatial and temporal relationships between what is observed on the ground and what can we derive through Earth observations. So in this case, we're, we're looking at the Copernicus reanalysis data set um, for what's called CARA West, which is a, I think a two and a half kilometer resolution um, reanalysis data set uh, for around Greenland and the Bering Sea, um, which put us into the area of interest that we were looking at in support of uh, protected areas in that region. Um, we were also combining that with the ISAT-2 satellite mission. So using um, ARD data sets for sea ice height as an example. So the Atlas uh, 07, I think it is, um, which gave us really good uh, coverage, um, trajectory-based coverage of sea ice height. So detecting leads as an example, which is really important to the ecosystems. And then bringing that in with the, uh, the Arctic SDI program and what's called CAF, um, who host a data service uh, where we can pull in sampling program observations. And combining the three, um, demonstrating um, how the relationship, if you will, or the trends of biodiversity changes uh, relative to the observations that we could derive through those satellite uh, missions. Next slide. <clears throat> So the challenge here though, when we get into ARD, and Peter just drew on this, um, analysis ready from a consumer standpoint is what I'm currently struggling with. And I had really hoped to have a good demonstration for you today of how we had solved that problem. And I, I just don't, I'm not there. Um, it's possible I just don't understand the arithmetic well enough. And Peter has been really, really helpful to me on uh, studying this area. From a provider centric, uh, approach it's it's really effective so i can go in and use again the the nsidc data sets and derive the the ci site for a particular area in this case it's it's a particular area um just to the west of greenland um in the canadian arctic and we can see the dynamic changes of of the sea ice um, and sea ice freeboards over this particular time period but the challenge I'm having, you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> but the challenge I'm having is I need to derive information um, from the satellite observations, not as specific to when the satellite observed the ground, if you will. Um, what I need to know is what is the best observation relative to an event that I'm studying on the ground. So if I've detected an anomaly um, within a protected area, um, where do I go find complementary information that is still relevant both from a time and space? So if the satellite is, goes overhead and it's a 91 day revisiting pattern, um, which, which uh, reference ground track do I use? Do I do I influence by you know, you know the temporal relationship? How how recent was it? Even if it's further away, um, or do I try to find the closest one from a physical standpoint? Uh, even though that that observation may have been 45 days ago, and I don't have an answer for that. And and this is where Peter's been talking to me a little bit about um, nearest neighbor interpolation, what have you, and 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 it's an area that I'm still struggling with. Next slide. So the geodata cubes is really effective from a provider standpoint again. So we can do um, surface albedo studies um, and pull that information together and we'll take a look at the differences, if you will. Next slide. But what happens when we're, we're taking a look from the ground truth? So I work within the connected systems group where we're provider centric and we're producing ARDs for in situ observations. But the um, OMS group, the observations and measurements group, we're more focused on the feature of interest and relationships to observations against an observable property. And that's where I'm trying to move back towards. 
So I, I apologize. I know this has been very high level and hand waving, um, but this is where we currently sit: is to try to figure out from a consumer standpoint, um, or more from a consumer centric standpoint, um, how do we derive observations relative to a feature of interest at a specific time and place, rather than from a from a platform specific uh, standpoint. And that's really where I am today. So, Josh, I apologize. I, I wish I had more uh, to go run on here, but hopefully it gives an appreciation for some of the struggles somebody from the outside looking in is running into when we're talking about analysis-ready data. Well, thanks very much, Glenn, for, for stepping up there and talking about, you know, the challenges of some real work. And particularly, I think that perspective of, you know, I'm interested in this part of the world, you know, what is there for me uh, as a perspective on analysis readiness? So exactly. we've had a number of different perspectives and uh, really appreciate all of the participants, that their hard work, their, their risk taking, and also their um, finishing up uh, the engineering report so that this will be a good record and, uh, and testament to that work. So I think we are done here and I turn things back to um, Greg Bueller, I think we're gonna take a break. Is that right? Yeah, let's let's just take a couple minute break. We'll get started at about seventeen past the hour. Just a couple minutes for a bio break for anybody if they need it. So about seventeen minutes past the hour, we'll get started. Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, I hope you're all back. Um, and that was a quick break for you. Anyway, we'll go ahead and get started again. Uh, my name is Greg Beeler. I'm the uh, task architect for the Agile Reference Architecture task in Testbed 19. Um, so I'd like to, first of all, thank our sponsors and participants. Uh, DSTL is a sponsor of, of this task, um, and we'll hear a little bit from them in a second. Um, European Union Satellite Center, uh, Interactive Instruments, Corona Wong AI, and Space Bell were the participants. Um, and we had uh, some great deliverables, and um, go ahead and talk through that real quick after we hear from Chris Lewis. Let me go ahead and... Get that going for you. Uh, 
agile reverence architecture task as encouraging the audience to begin a journey. To define where the industry is with our current reference model architecture, where we are heading in the near term as technology and ideas are developed, and ultimately to determine the direction for our community for the generation after next data and services. This task does not answer all of these questions, but is intended to provide a baseline on which future initiatives will build upon in order to reach forward into the next more flexible reference architectures and ultimately to the agile reference architecture of the generation of the next. I can say that throughout the process, the continued outputs over the year have influenced how we as sponsors have thought about our initial question and so have developed our own understanding of what an agile reference architecture would look like and what is required. I would also like to think that our conversations with the OGC, that they have also gained valuable insight in the questions that were asked in the process and what may need to be considered in the years ahead in developing the OGC reference architecture. As I said at the start of this work, we always see great outputs from the test beds. And I can say that even asking a challenging question as we have, that everyone involved in this task rose to the occasion and has provided the same high standard of output. And we continue to place a high value on what we see from the community. Okay, <clears throat> pardon me. Well, as Chris noted, uh, we did not solve this problem in this task. Um, we've only just begun it. Um, our goals here, though, are stated um, to aim to create, develop, and identify the architectural elements uh, for agile reference architectures, to understand how these can be used for defining different use cases that allow different implementations for OGC API building blocks, uh, this work is seeking to inform how resilient data services and the generation after next will operate. Some of the challenges and important considerations we needed to look at were, um, and these were not all addressed, um, need to address the challenge of resilience, integration and interoperability, universal access for discovery and assurance, transformation of heterogeneous data sources into locally useful data forms, including reformatting and dimensional up and downscaling, continuous integration and testing, and network characteristics and incorporating intelligent monitoring to ensure quality of service. You'll hear the term IPT several times today. And what is it and why is it important? Um, it stands for integrity, provenance, and trust. And it's really the way you look at data services to determine, number one, are they fit for purpose? They fit for my purpose, right? Uh, think of the questions that we've already heard from geodata analysis ready data today. Um, they're asking those questions. Number two, uh, provenance. Uh, am I confident about where the data is coming from? Um, the lineage of it? Uh, we've heard that discussed yesterday in geospatial and space task, right? Um, number three, can I trust both the data and the services as they're applied? Um, and we just heard that from machine learning as well, machine learning and transfer learning tasks. So it's all integrated for OGC to think about these three things together. Um, and uh, so we're looking at that, uh, have been looking at that, and we'll continue to look at that. We've also heard uh, the word building blocks. Um, we've determined over the course of this test bed that the term building block is very limited. Um, that different organizations see things differently um, and based upon your perspective um, and your context, uh, building blocks, the term building blocks uh, might be used differently. Um, we look at this as something that OGC community has to solve um, in the near future um, to allow all our communities to work together um, to, uh, to continue to find what, what a building block is and how, how, how it's useful. 
Um, here's an example of uh, an agile reference architecture, for example, if you talk about uh, the process of collection or processing, um, that there are different modules or building blocks uh, that you can use um, and that you might use based upon uh, the use cases that you have in, in, in store of your, for your organization. The deliverables of this task um, are listed here. I'm not going to go over them in detail. Um, but I see them as, as three different, three separate groups. Number one is the, uh, the engineering report itself, and we'll hear, we'll hear about that one last. Um, the, second, the second two are really uh, a semantic solution to, to the, the situation that we're, we're asking. And the last uh, several are really just the existing or in development OGC standards um, that can be applied and, and modified to address Agile reference architectures as they unfold. Um, here's our order of demonstrations today. We'll, we'll have interactive instruments, a video from them from Spacebell will have two. Uh, Karawang AI will do a live uh, discussion and demonstration, uh, and then we'll follow up uh, with the engineering report from uh, Lucio from the European Union Satellite Center. Um, if we have time, we'll do question and answer um, as well. Without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Clemens, do you want to say anything before we get started? On no, your I think you. I think you covered it. So let's start the video. Okay. To support the Agile Reference Architecture task of OGC Testbed 19, Interactive Instruments provided four APIs publishing datasets with geospatial feature data. All four APIs were published using LDProxy, an open source tool that makes geospatial data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable via modern web APIs. It is a reference implementation for the OGC API features standard. LD proxy is available as a Docker image to simplify deployments of web APIs for sharing geospatial data. All APIs were deployed as Docker containers. The first API served OS Open Zoom stack data as vector tiles implementing the OGC API features, tiles and styles standards. OS Open Zoom stack is a comprehensive vector base map showing coverage of Great Britain at a national level, right down to street level detail. It is published by Ordnance Survey Great Britain. Here we see a web map using the OS Open Zoom stack vector tiles and the road style as served by the API. In addition, Interactive Instruments provided two APIs implementing OGC API features based on OpenStreetMap data. The first of those APIs represented the OpenStreetMap data from the region of Dara, Syria. According to the NSG Topographic Data Store Schema of the U.S. National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and GA, this data set has also been used in previous OGC test beds and pilots. This API also provides vector tiles and styles as resources. Here we see cultural features. Interactive Instruments maintains the OS Open Zoom Stack and DARA APIs as LD Proxy demonstration APIs on demoldproxy.net. Instructions how to deploy these two APIs with all configuration files is available in a public GitHub repository. The second API with OpenStreetMap data is based on data from Tunisia, converted to a variant of the Multinational Geospatial Co-Production Program Schema, MGCP, by the European Union Satellite Center, SATSEN. The data set was provided by SATSEN to interactive instruments for use in Testbed 19 in the SRE file geodatabase format. When starting an API with a data set, the feature types with their properties are derived from the database and the default LD proxy API building blocks are enabled. Basically all building blocks from OGC API features part 1 and 2. Here we navigate the API to the first page of feature collection PZD040. Such an API is only useful if the user or the client understands what a PZD040 feature is or what the meaning of an attribute ACC with a value of 1 is. Satsen maintains a data dictionary for their datasets that provides the schema information. The data dictionary was provided to interactive instruments as an XML file. Using a Python script, the configuration for the feature types was updated to include titles and descriptions for feature types and attributes. 
constraints on attributes, and the code lists for coded values. After restarting the API, the first HTML page of collection, PZD040, included additional information about the feature type, its attributes and their values, which are essential to make data accessible and interoperable. Schema support was also enabled in the configuration of the API and enables clients to determine the schema of the features in the dataset via the API. Here we see the schema for the PZD040 features, which represent named locations with a point geometry. The fourth API was an instance of OGC API features supporting real-time observations. For the testbed, surface-based weather observations from the WMO Information System WIS 2.0 were used, in addition to access to the data using the API building blocks of OGC API features. The API also supported publish subscribe for feature resources based on current discussions in OGC how to publish event. Driven APIs such as publish messages whenever a feature is created, updated or deleted. In order to publish observation data via the publish subscribe extension for OGC API features, several components were developed and deployed as containers. This diagram provides an overview of the relevant components and their interactions. The WIS 2.0 MQTT broker is an external component, operated by Meteo France. It publishes weather observations from countries across the globe. The WIS 2.0 Surface Observation Harvester, implemented by Interactive Instruments in Testbed 19, subscribes to surface weather observations published by the WIS 2.0 MQTT broker, processes them, and posts the results to the LD proxy instance to create new observation features that are stored in a PostGIS database. Two harvesters have been deployed for Testbed 19, one to gather surface weather observations from Sweden and one to do so from Morocco. Write access to the LD proxy instance was restricted to authenticated clients. In the testbed, Interactive Instruments used Keycloak as an identity provider and the OpenID Connect client credentials flow to ensure that only harvester instances could create new observations. Once a new observation feature was created, messages were published via a Mosquito MQTT broker. Such messages could be received using any MQTT client for each new observation feature created in the API. Two messages were published via the Mosquito MQTT broker. One message with the complete new observation feature in GeoJSON, which is what we see here in MQTT Explorer, a freely available MQTT client, which constantly receives new observations for the API. The second type message are just the numeric value of the observation in a topic for the weather station and observed property, which allows to subscribe to specific types of observations. Here we see air temperature observations at a Swedish weather station. The Publish Subscribe API was documented and specified using Async API, the industry standard for defining asynchronous APIs. This diagram provides an overview of the containers, images and repositories of the Weather Observation API. The four APIs shown in this video were based on state-of-art technologies and open standards such as the OGC API standards, GeoJSON, Open API, Async API, MQTT, Docker, OpenID Connect and others. These APIs were provided as a basis for experiments for an agile evolution of IT architectures to meet emerging demands for sharing, processing and using geospatial data as investigated in the Agile Reference Architecture task of OGC Testbed 19. Okay, thank you. Clemens, anything you'd like to follow up with on that? <clears throat> no, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, next we will go ahead with Eve Cohn from Spacebell. Uh, Eve, anything you'd like to start with? Hi, no, Greg. I think the only thing I want to say is that in the API records uh, instance that we have put in place, we have put the metadata of all the uh, what were called building blocks in this project, so the, uh, the collections and the services. And I hope that the uh, video explains that well. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and start the video. Welcome to our presentation on the Agile Reference Architecture as part of the OGC Testbed 19 initiative. Our contribution to this groundbreaking endeavor includes the development of deliverables D123 and D128, which are instances of OGC API processes 
and OGC API records respectively. In our demonstration of the API records interface, we utilize the Stack Browser Client, a user-friendly tool that showcases the capabilities of our implementation. To begin, select the API button located at the top right of the interface. This action reveals the conformance classes supported by our system. To explore the EO Services and Applications collection, simply click the Home Page widget. Use the Show Filters button to enter Testbed 19 in the query and submit. The three results you'll see represent the services crafted in the Testbed 19 Agile Reference Architecture task. Select D124, OGC API features serving OpenStreetMap to view its metadata on the left in formats like ISO 19139, OGC 19020R1, and GeoDCAT AP. Click OGC 19020R1 to see details like offerings and landing page. For the GeoDCAT AP view, hit the JSON-LD link at the bottom left. This displays contact info, collection details, and endpoints. Finally, click Description of the Resource to visit the service's homepage by Interactive Instruments. Return to the browser's home page by clicking FedEO Clearinghouse at the top left. Choose Search for Collections and enter Testbed 19 as the search term. This will confirm the presence of two collections prepared for the Testbed 19 ARA task. Select the OpenStreetMap Data collection to view its page information. Note that the metadata is available in various formats like ISO and OGC. From the home page, click the EO Services and Applications widget, add a filter, and select Organization Name Space Bell. This leads you to the detailed metadata of the API Processes service, where you'll find various metadata formats. Here, the offering information includes key elements like the landing page, describe process, and more. The process description provides the definition of the OGC process prepared for generating a building block as output of a reprojection function. The catalog's content is accessible in the form of linked data, specifically utilizing the GeoDCAT AP format. This allows for seamless visualization through clients like LOD View. The metadata provides a direct link to the building block by using a URL which serves as the URI for the building block within the Rainbow system. Additionally, this connects to the Rainbow Knowledge Graph. Furthermore, Spacebill's services can be accessed using identifiers that comply with W3C's distributed identification standards as shown here. I trust you found the demonstration informative and enjoyable. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Eve, anything you'd like to follow up with on that one? No, not really. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them later on. Okay. We'll move on next to our OGC API pro processes. Uh, Christoph, anything you'd like to talk about before we get started on this one? Just, just to mention that in, in our VAT radio, we, we try to explain how an implementation of OGC API processes can inject output data uh, exposed by an API, what we call building blocks, instead of traditional URL uh, outputs. So I, I hope that the video explained that uh, correctly. Okay, excellent. We have identified a concrete enhancement of OGC API processes to contribute to the review of a new Agile architecture. In the context of this presentation, the term building block refers exclusively to the definition provided on the official OGC website, a reusable subset or complete OGC API standard. The CFP states that the Agile reference architecture aims to address the challenges of integration interoperability. 
and another key objectives is to transform data sources into data forms that are locally useful. Our intention is to infuse these principles into API processes by facilitating dynamic chaining of processes. To better understand our motivation with a concrete use case, I need to introduce a fictional process named URBA. URBA is a environment analysis software for tracking cities' urbanization. As input, a vector representation of roads, buildings, parks, water bodies, etc. for last 20 years. As output, a heat map vector highlighting areas of rapid urban growth. The OGC application package allows to encapsulate all the computational details in a container. The OGC API processes focuses on providing a standard interface to discover, execute, and retrieve the result of the process. Indeed, OGC API processes provides a standard operation for executing URBA, and it handles the staging in of the inputs, the scheduling and execution of the application on a computing infrastructure within the container, and the stage out of the results. To better understand the gap we want to fulfill, we need to imagine a second fictional process. CityStats is also a geospatial analysis tool, but instead of consuming SHP file, it consumes a set of GeoJSON inputs. The problem for chaining the two processes is of course about the interoperability of I.O. formats. But this might be also related to the fact a temporal or spatial subset of the data is required only. In past OGC testbeds, the solution is always simple. The developers of the processes are involved in the project and they can either extend the process with additional supported format and implement internally the subsetting. To facilitate the chaining of processes, the building blocks offer an abstract data store with operations that can be used to retrieve data in the form required by the process. The output can be also provisioned as a building block. The implementation required to be able to provision those transient building blocks serving the output resources. So in addition, with the control flow defined by the processing chain workflow, the processing server manages the data flow by querying and provisioning building blocks. To support the provisioning of transient building block, those OGC components are able to serve on the fly the vector data which is dynamically mounted to the container. And we need a set of native formats to be supported by the component. Therefore, in the context of this testbed, it was necessary to simulate such component as we focused on the implementation of the API processes. A demonstration of the OGC API processes implementation is now provided. Let's start by taking a look at the open API specification of our service. Next, we'll explore the process description. This is where we define the interface for our initial sample processing task, which is, quite simply, a straightforward copy operation. This segment will focus on selecting a set of features from the OGC API features implementation. Our task is to perform a selection from the OpenStreetMap collection, specifically targeting an area of interest within a specified time window. Once this selection is made, we'll show you how to copy the URL. This URL will then serve as our input for the next steps. Let's dive in and see how it's done. We've now reached the final step. We're about to submit the execution of the copy process. We've already provided the selected set of features as input. Watch as the OGC API processes spring into action, provisioning a new instance of OGC API features 
with our process output as its content. As we turn to the Kubernetes monitoring display, you'll notice the job instance and the ID proxy server instance, which implements the OGC API features being provisioned. And here's the important part. By using the output URL, we can display the content of the OGC API features server. You'll see it contains the exact input features we selected for the process execution. Okay, Christoph, anything else you'd like to add to your video? No, thank you. I'm also happy to address any question. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go to uh, Nick. Are you ready for me yes. to pass over to you? Already, thanks, Greg. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, Greg, did you want to? Oh, okay. I'll share my screen. Yes. Yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself as well, Nick. I guess is. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, I will do that. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to select my screen, and this is, I hope, not too small. I think it's going to be too small. <laughs> uh, let me just see if I, I. What I want to do is present just that section. I don't want to present the whole screen. I'm just trying to see if I can work out how to do that. Yeah. Aha, window, got it. Okay, all right, I think we're good enough. There you uh, hello, go. That's... So Nicholas Carr here. Yeah, that's better. Nicholas Carr from Caron AI, and uh, we worked on two deliverables within this Agile Reference Architecture test, test bed. Uh, three members of the company worked on these deliverables, and uh, we were involved in quite a different set of challenges to the um, to the couple of tasks that we've seen beforehand. I guess we were addressing some more uh, basic in the in the kind of lower level sense issues to do with interoperability of uh, architectures that contain the reference material for agile ref, agile architectures. So our, our two so rather than in, uh, rather than demonstrations of a, a piece of agile reference architecture, we're dealing with some more fundamental issues. Um, the uh, the two questions we faced were to build an integrated knowledge base linking machine readable specifications required uh, for a, a particular use case. That's D121 and D122 to actually represent the agile reference architecture in it says there in RDF Turtle format. Uh, we'll change that wording slightly. And we're going to present those in the reverse order that you see them there. So we're going to talk about D122 first and then D121. Okay, so D122, uh, that's the wording there. We take this really to mean to create a semantic web model of building blocks, which we've heard about, um, really to take advantage of several semantic web capabilities. Um, so this is uh, not a, a semantic web representation of metadata for something else, but the, actually of the building blocks themselves, you know, what the building blocks are about. Um, and our work plan to do this was to facilitate others' development of the building blocks conceptual model in semantic web form. So rather than actually making a model ourselves, we, we, we worked out that we needed to facilitate the OGC naming authority and others doing this. Um, and that's because we can't possibly know everything there is to know about um, building blocks and other people who use them know more, um, but we need to facilitate their work. And we provided some test uh, case modeling. Uh, I've mentioned those points. Okay, so a bit of background, and I'm not going to read every word here because we've actually heard these points. This is the definition of the building blocks. Um, so they um, are, as has been read out in a previous presentation. Um, just a note that there, the intended action here was to uplift the description of the building blocks into semantic web form. Uh, so to present the building block content as, uh, as a knowledge graph, um, and then to place them within a larger knowledge graph. One of the spin-offs for this would be we would get best case fair scores for these building blocks because they would have maximally reusable standardized uh, information. 
Uh, but um, the uplift of the definitions of building blocks into semantic web form has actually been going on and has been conducted by the OGC naming authority itself throughout the life of this project. Um, so to actually, again, define building blocks in a semantic web model and do that work is not really the ultimately not the, the, the main game in this project for us because it's, it's being done. Um, so we decided to then focus on some challenges around aspects of building blocks, whether in semantic web form or not. Um, and the particular ones we looked at were building block grouping. So what is needed to sum up a building block grouping to achieve a complete OGC standard? Um, and, and, and this hinges on how to define compatibility between building blocks and aggregations. So if you give me 50 building blocks and say, these form a standard, you know, all of the um, conformance classes within the standard, if I'm to recompose different building blocks and pinch them from here and there everywhere, how do I ensure that they are actually compatible? Um, and then separately to how to maximize reusability, how to actually help people reuse building blocks um, to discover them and use them. Um, so the first task we undertook was actually an in-kind contribution uh, that was to uh, create auto documentation software uh, to generate specifications of the style of specification you see for the OGC, like the, the uh, OGC API specification and many others, um, but based on data. So uh, we used a tool that previously has been used to document uh, semantic web ontology. You give it an ontology, it produces an HTML page, and now we wanted to give it a set of building blocks and it would go and build the documentation for those. Now this was um, contributed work sort of starting before the project and we weren't directly looking at building blocks, we were looking at modularized ontologies, but there's many principles that are common here. Um, as it says here, it handles multi-part specifications and it uses the profiles vocabulary, which is a W3C vocabulary, to actually join the elements together. And now the resultant thing from this was a very large document called the ICSM conceptual model for cadastral survey data set submissions, uh, but it's a, a, a long model, uh, a, a multi-part model for cadastral data, um, a data model that is defined in these parts here. So there's many parts, many of these are recognizable OGC things. Uh, there's the uh, SOSA ontology there, the Semantic Sense Network ontology, many others, GeoSparkle for instance, um, and they were bolted together with the superstructure that was this uh, profiles vocabulary work. Um, so the, the issues we identified in this pre-work were that we needed, we thought we might need variations on dependency relationships, but we were actually able to live without that. So we could, you, we could use just direct relationships it depends on between many parts of things to construct an overall envelope standard for them without especially detailed things, because we could calculate all of the other information we needed. Um, we worked out how to override certain elements of standards and, and so on, and the, and the details in the actual documentation tooling describe what assumptions it makes there. Um, a big issue we had was dependency resolution. If we're given a set of resources and said document them, some of those are likely not to be given locally. They're actually references to things on the internet and elsewhere. And what do we do about those? Do we, put, do we expect to follow and pull in those resources? So for instance, if we were given building blocks that were referred to non uh, OGC um, rainbow components, would we actually go and pull those in? And the last thing we looked at was the um, ontological rule representation, which we had to deal with in not just um, ontological rules of the owl sort, but also shackle rules, which are kind of the, the modern flavor for doing uh, data modeling rules. Uh, now to the actual task itself, um, the uh, assessment of BB of building blocks compatibility. Uh, this is currently unresolved. We don't know how to assess uh, overall, whether building blocks in a certain set are compatible or not. Um, we can understand how you might make such assessments, oops, sorry, um, against predefined building blocks, looking backwards, these could be defined. You could say these are or are not compatible. You might be able to calculate this, um, but um, uh, that might involve looking inside the building blocks. And, and we, this is theoretically problematic because this is the kind of parts of the atom problem. Building blocks are meant to be atomic, and yet to understand you know, the ways in which one might be compatible with another might require us to look inside the dimensions of the building block, you know, lower than the actual whole. Um, now, we've deferred this problem to be solved by the naming authority because they are stacking up the experience and the data to actually make that kind of um, you know, style of solution assessment in the future. 
Um, the reusability um, also currently unsolved, but we've worked on this. And uh, really, I'll just summarize and say here that sophisticated cataloging is part of the solution. I'm just going to skip ahead very quickly now to mention, uh, I'm just going to mention and then demonstrate a little bit about the integrated knowledge base. Uh, so we essentially uh, worked on um, linking uh, machine readable specifications, but we didn't address the use case that was also part of the initial question. We, we just simply ran out of time on that. Um, so to integrate the knowledge base, uh, we took the uplifted building blocks into semantic web form and put them into a knowledge graph. Um, and then we uh, um, implemented an OGC records API on top, a catalog on, based on top of that. Um, so we have the integration within the knowledge graph, uh, but the regular access of a familiar OGC records API. Um, and um, uh, this is because we, we have to work within the constraints of existing OGC processes and, and projects. We really have to build on top of tooling that the OGC has, and the OGC already have records APIs and things like that, so we, we have to extend on those. Um, so we enhance, we are planning to and are enhancing the OGC Naming Authority catalog. Uh, we're going to extend the current vocabulary catalog to a more generic um, catalog of all kinds of things, and in particular, uh, we're looking at catalogs of um, building blocks and also of specifications or standards separately to the building blocks. Um, and uh, we have done some uh, work to ensure that building blocks can be discoverable and usable through, you know, standard query languages like CQL. Uh, okay, so I will zoom ahead here. Uh, there's some notes which can be read another time, but let's see. Uh, the actual implementation uh, of the catalog is very rough looking because we haven't done any styling here yet. Uh, but what we're seeing is an OGC records API on top of a knowledge graph um, of the various building blocks. Now, we, we're not trying to, in this work, differentiate uh, or deal with the question of what the building blocks actually represent. Uh, all we're trying to do is to show that they can be listed in here and whatever properties building blocks have and however they're meant to be related, uh, this system can handle that. It can display those properties, it can utilize them. And the big enabling factor behind all of this is that the content of this catalog is defined in a data profile. So the data profile we've developed is a profile of a building block. So all the things you want to know about a building block are defined in the data profile. And then that gives you a mechanism for uh, documenting the building blocks uh, for, to indicate uh, which properties are necessary, you know, a validation, um, display, and so on. Um, we've done some other background work to do things like translate data specifications into queries against the knowledge graph too, so that we can define building blocks, store them, and retrieve them and work with them. And my last slide, um, we haven't yet addressed the uh, DDIL use case, um, but we have some perspectives on how this might be done, and we believe that with the uh, catalog-based reference architecture that we've uh, stepped towards in this project, uh, we're going to be able to answer some of the questions that were posed at the beginning of this project um, uh, with a renewed OGC naming authority architecture in place, let's hope, within the next, say, six months. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, so Nick has been, uh, uh, he and his team, uh, David Hadgood, has been uh, very active, uh, staying up late while the rest of us are, are working normal day hours. So it's been fantastic working with them over the last uh, several months and look forward to doing that in the future. Okay, well, let me go ahead. Lucio, are you ready for us? I'm gonna go ahead and present your slides for you. All right, uh, if you can present the slides. Uh, well, yeah, I will do that. Easier. <laughs> there, there you go. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to work in this uh, activity. Lucio um, Prego from European Satsen. And next, what we are dealing here is to try to, uh, as a user point of view in this kind of test bed, is to try to uh, define which are the elements as written here and highlighted by Greg in the past, in the previous presentation. So this is the scope of the agile reference architecture to identify architecture elements for this new architecture and uh, to try to have uh, use cases for implementing uh, OGC API building block. Next. 
uh, at the end, uh, what we have here, uh, we are working now in these uh, days on infrastructure that are based over 20 years of models that are really not adapted to, to the current scenario. So uh, that is quite highly dynamic and evolving. So main points for this are flexibility to adapt to developing infrastructure security, data center security, then the provenance and trust as highlighted before. Also, we have impact on artificial, artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Next slide. Thank you to the group of people working in this uh, work package because we we're really interesting discussion and contribution uh, for all the definition and terms we were working with. And uh, we highlight several things that you will see in the next slide. Next, please. A, as a basis of all the work we have done, and we were using a lot of information coming from OGC reference model, DGIWG architecture, different architecture proposal, open group, the open group architecture framework, and many others. Reference, you will find this in the engineering report. Next. Main element for the discussion in this uh, in this uh, engineering report were exactly the building, bro building block approach. And we have seen, as uh, also Greg highlighted, that there is a lack of common standardized definition of you know gc terms of building block what the reality is the data center security that is defined but should be adopted in all the standard because one of the most important uh, item in this is the fact that all the information and the process we are running we are using should be somehow certified and we should trust as you will see in the next point that is the, the, the integrity so trust of data and the processes mainly mm, principally important for the artificial intelligence and also the other processing we are doing because the amount of data and processes available is enormous and this, this can create a problem if you don't trust really all this information next so the scenario is the following I, we can say that in today's infrastructure, we have a lot of processing or just patient data taking place in predefined network and points. So each participating operator hosts the defin defined functionality that is somehow in a network and point or an operator. Other than the point provide a direct access to processing functionalities, other are to upload capabilities. So at the, at the end, we have a, a, a discrete and spread approach to all this information. This cause that the, the infrastructure is not really agile because you have to build the entire processing chain, the entire services on top of fix and then the point. And then if you modify this or to change this, it requires time, time that is not really, how to say, um, uh, perfect for the needs in this uh, uh, quite dynamic and evolving scenario we are facing these days. Next. At Satsen, we started the last year an experiment as a prototype in trying to implement DCS, uh, Identity Provenance Trust, in our workflow. Uh, we found out a nice name for this because it's a federated system. The idea of to create a federated system is a prototype based on a federated, agile, collaborative trust system. Uh, as we said, this is something that we need uh, to have because Satsen is, or, is also in touch with other organizations and data providers. So we would like to have something that is comprehensive to uh, enable IPT in, all the, in this uh, contest. Next. One of the main point we have found is that we at the end need what we define the collaborative object. So something that is uh, dynamic that is able to have uh, a sort of uh, 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 smart approach to the information so the data becomes a little bit smarter and the API and the process also they have a sort of smart uh, definition that enable the collaboration and interaction with objects. Next. As we say, the trust and assurance is quite important. It's also important in other standards like STANAG 4774. So uh, the idea is to have something that is able to activate operation in a trusted way and to create with these services or elaborate and provide and create a new data out of the, the schema, the workflow we are defining next. So we were focusing in this experiment and also in the engineering report, you will find more information in two main aspects, collaborate object data and building block. Next. For the data, we introduced the sort of wrapping like a smart certificate. Next. 
a smart certificate is a sort of uh, definition, a sort of uh, an, uh, an attest a verifiable attestation in which we add more information that enable the uh, API or the other object to interact directly with this object. This is based in our experiment with the blockchain. So uh, with the blockchain, so this stuff is uh, strongly uh, ensured that before publication is strongly fixed before publication. So the, the entire process of the information is based on this blockchain concept, concept and then we can have something that is more uh, reliable, so trusted. Next. The idea is to have the OGC XYZ standard for data format, EPT enabling with the adding, with the add-on of the smart certificate. So basically a revision or just a plus version of the standard in which we can have uh, the IPT uh, enabling of the data format. Next. For the building block, we, as I said before, we introduced the smart contract. That is uh, the concept I was describing before. And we have basically to define these three elements, the building block definition, that is something that has to be harmonized. In this case, we can use an example persistent volume architecture in Kubernetes and the smart contract itself. Next. I took as a reference the definition of building block by the, the open group uh, architecture framework that I think is enough valid for what we are doing. But again, this is a matter of discussion as Greg highlighted at the beginning. And I think it's something that uh, the OGC will take in charge in trying to define the proper definition for building block. Next. For the Kubernetes persistent volume, if you don't know, is something that is able where you are, that is created in Kubernetes in which you can put data and application. In this case, we have an orchestrator. In the, in the engineering report, you will find more information about the usage of this, but this is a space where you can drop data and API, or the API are there listening for data coming, and so they can concatenate the processes and create a new data, as you will see in a while, with some information. Next. So the smart contract is something that is a computer program or a transaction protocol that is intended to automatically execute control or document events and action according to the term of a contract agreement between the different API and the data. In, the, in our example, again, the smart contract is recording all the processing metadata to provide information in the blockchain before the services is published. Next. So the idea basically, yeah is an example, but just for discussion. For example, using the Team Engine Plus, when you publish a new version of the OGC API and you go through the Team Engine, you can have a sort of plus version in which you have the OGC API with the smart contract and, it's, and it is IPT enabled. Next. The idea, the general idea, this is something really generic in which we have data with the smart contract, smart certificate, sorry, in uh, orange, and for the API, the smart contract in green. And then if you have this kind of process is taking place for a given purpose, for example, if you have an image that is arriving in uh, this persistent volume, and you can directly uh, check that it is a raw image coming from XYZ, and you see that it is a raw image, you can activate, for example, auto ratification or histogram organization or whatever you want. And then you have a derived data that is the auto ratified image with a smart certificate, but you can trust the entire process. This is just a simple example, just as an idea. Next. Uh, in the document, in the general report, we find these things. For food work, we can say that data centric security is something important for all the uh, activity at OGC and all the standard of OGC. And also, we have found that this is an important item of discussion the discovery of decentralized application, like uh, we said before. These two main items, as I said, what we have done up to the moment is just a study, so just a starting point for all the activity. But I think these two uh, points are, are subject for future discussion and work in the, in the OGC framework. Next. That I said, uh, from my point of view personally, I would consider to prioritize the building block OGC definition standardization, data centric security, and with all this, improve the trustworthy of data produced by artificial intelligence and reliability of this data. And also to take into account the impact of all the new technology coming that can really be disrupting for what is the uh, current uh, architectural framework of OGC and the standardization activities. Next. 
if I don't know, ah, you skip at the last one. Okay. Um, during the work year, we did an experiment with uh, uh, with the data. Uh, so there is the possibility to the next Delft meeting to propose everybody a sort of more detailed presentation with some uh, proof of concept and uh, uh, show you what is possible to do in this uh, with this kind of approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucio. I appreciate it. Um, we have any other questions? It doesn't look like it. We're over time like normal. Uh, I think uh, that's a good trend for all of our projects. So, um, but I think if there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and take a break until quarter after the hour and go ahead and start with uh, high performance computing at uh, 15 minutes past. Okay, thank you very much.
Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, Greg, should we start? Yep, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, so my name is Sina Tagavikish, and I work as the project manager for the COSI uh, Collaborative uh, Solutions and Innovation Program at uh, OGC. Uh, one of the tasks that I was an architect for uh, for Testbed 19 was the high is the high performance computing, and given our current uh, basically uh, challenges, uh, current sustainability problems such as climate change. Uh, there is a great need uh, for a larger scale geospatial analytic call computation. Uh, also, uh, we, need, uh, we need to simplify the use of HPC so that scientists basically, they don't need to be uh, programming gurus to utilize it, right? So high performance computing basically is um, uh, are uh, typically clusters and supercomputers that are traditionally hardwired. Uh, the concept is a bit changing, but that's how it, tra it traditionally was. So they are complex and require a great deal of programming knowledge to access. Uh, on the other hand, uh, application of programming, um, application programming interfaces, APIs, are familiar tools for the geospatial community. Uh, and HPC systems, um, with the help of APIs, really can become more accessible and more user friendly, and they can become HPGCs, where G stands for geospatial. And uh, yeah, the question is, does that does that make sense? So our uh, basically uh, panel are uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, I want to thank uh, iGuide for sponsoring this thread. Uh, uh, Forcom will present shortly. Um, and other than that, I also want to thank our uh, participants that uh, will actually go into depth and provide you with some uh, more uh, information regarding this. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to present the first uh, uh, presentation uh, Gerald, are you uh, ready to go? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you perfectly well. Thank you very much. So, hello everyone. I am Gerald Fonois from the Geolabs company. I am here today to present you the result of our involvement in the HPGC testbed 19 activity. Next slide, please. Our role in this activity was to provide an open source prototype server instance for the HPGC API. More specifically, we focused on implementing the prototype, uh, a prototype for HPGC, following the OGC API processes part one core standard and the OGC API processes part two deploy, replace, and in deploy draft specification. The idea was to update the implementation already available within the Zoo project to execute remote application on HPC using Slurm and OpenSSH to enable the deployment and execution of applications encapsulated within a singularity container. Next slide, please. As said earlier, we based our work on the Zoo project. It's an open source reference implementation for the OGC API processes part one core standard. It contains the zoo kernel as its cert, which can handle various processes. Processes can be, for example, your own program or any applications that are available in the Orfeo Toolbox software or the Saga JS. Zoo kernel relies on the map server software to provide basic OGC data access web services, such as WMS, WFS, WCS, and OGC API features part one core. Next slide, please. Okay, as you can see on this uh, crosswalk table, the OGC API processes part two deploy, replace, and in deploy draft specification define three operations deploy, replace, and in deploy. If the draft specification defines other requirement class, we will only use the following deploy, replace, and deploy OGC application package and Docker 
conformance classes during our pre this presentation. Next slide, please. <coughs> okay. So here is the application package schema that was modified during this activity. It, it, define, uh, it is defined as an object with two attributes. The first attribute is the process description, which contains the metadata information about the process to be deployed, and an execution unit that defines the element to be executed. In our case, a singularity container. Next slide, please. Thank you. Here is the uh, execution unit schema. Uh, is it, uh, it is a JSON object that requires to get the type and image attribute defined as defined in the Docker requirement class. So in a, the optional deployment attribute can be used specifically where the application should be deployed. You can see the enumeration there and you have the HPC in the list. Next slide, please. Uh, previous one, thank you. Here we present the deploy operation uh, as it was implemented in the prototype server implementation. In summary, a client sends an OGC application package to the Zoo project. It is then responsible, the Zoo project, to deploy the Singularity container on the HPC and also to publish the metadata associated with the process. You can see the execution unit used to deploy the process on the bottom right part of the slide. As you can guess, with the Docker image reference, it is based on Orfeo toolbox and more precisely on the machine and deep learning for Earth observation, Docker image, MDL for EO, which is the code name. Uh, it contains an Orfeo toolbox distribution with the OTBTF uh, remote module, which adds processes, uh, objects that internally invokes TensorFlow. In the bottom left corner, you can see the additional parameters that we used to bind in uh, the process execution. Next slide, please. Here you can see what happened behind the scene in the current implementation where the cli client uh, invokes the process execution. Initially, the input data are downloaded and then uploaded to the HPC. Then an S batch file is produced based on the processing binding defined when the process was deployed. It contains the instruction to execute the program on HPC through Slurm. Once the S batch is scheduled by Slurm, the Zoo kernel responsible for the execution gets back a job identifier from Slurm. This is not the job identifier defined in the OGC API processes. Uh, are two draft specification, but one specifically made available by Slurm. With this job identifier, the Zoo kernel will invoke the finalized HPC process to verify if the S batch is complete, has run or not. Once it completes, a message is sent to the Zoo kernel responsible for the process execution to make it continue the processing. This means downloading the data and potent potentially uh, publishing them uh, depending on the media type selected from the available one, as we will see in the demo demonstration video after a while. Next slide, please. So here you can press the play. And in this video, we will see the, the deployment and the execution of Orfeo Toolbox Band Mat X encapsulated in the OTBTF Docker image. OTB bandmatics perform a basic mathematical operation on several multiband images. If you can press the play button, if it works, please. On the, oh, okay. From the landing page, we can access the API documentation. From there, we can interact with the open API. This open API illustrates how to deploy singularity containers and execute applications on remote HPC. We can read the description of the API and use the client ID value to authenticate. You need to use your OGC GitLab account to authenticate. From the slash processes endpoint, we can list the processes available on the server instance. We can note that the default processes have a mutable attribute set to false, meaning that you can interact with them only using the OGC API processes part one standard. 
we can deploy a new process using an OGC application package document. It contains a process description and an execution unit. For the process binding, we use additional parameters at various levels. By pressing the execute button, we get a process summary document. If we go back to the processes list, we should find a new process available with the mutable attribute set to true. We can now try to execute the deployed process on the remote HPC. As defined in the OGC API Processes Part 1 core standard, you should get a status information document when you execute a process asynchronously. It contains a job ID that can be used in the slash job slash job ID endpoint. It is used to get up-to-date status information about the job we run. The execution takes some time, and the transfers required between the processing engine and the HPC could be more performant. At the end of the execution, we get a results location. Meaning that we can now access the results produced by the execution. We can use the job ID in the slash job slash job ID slash results endpoint. As we use the image slash PNG media type in our execute request, we got back a WMS gitmap URL. When you are done with your process, you can use the undeploy operation to get it removed from the available processes. Thank you. If you can move to the next slide, please. So on this slide, we present the Zoo Project DRU M chart. That is the deployment of the Zoo Project with uh, OGC API processes part two draft specification on a Kubernetes cluster with a CWL conformance class. Also, we published a dedicated Docker image, including the HPGC support presented today. It is distributed under the Zoo Project organization on Docker Hub. You can follow the link to download it. Next slide, please. Here are our, here are our summary and recommendation. We clarified the Docker requirement class from the OGC API processes part two draft specification. We modified the OGC application schema associated with the Docker requirement class and added the optional deployment attribute we used in our implementation. With the work and led, the Zoo project can now deploy and execute Singularity container on HPC. There are still rooms for improvement in the prototype implementation uh, we provide here. So the first one is to have a prototype working in the short term, uh, as we were willing to have a prototype working in the short term. When the test bed started, we reused the process description uh, as we found them in other instances. But using a dedicated process description would have helped to avoid downloading input data before uploading them on the HPC. We may have used, for instance, uh, the simple VSI a CURL mechanism from GitHub. Uh, also, a second point is that in the future, we would like to investigate the use of CWL for remote HPC execution. This will make the solution more generic and remove the implementation-specific process binding we have defined. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, so this is it for me. I hope you liked the presentation. Thank you for your listening. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, Eugene, before I play the video, do you want to introduce yourself or say something? Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm Eugene Yu from uh, from Georgia Mason University. So we have a team to work on most of the two components in this for this uh, uh, task. One is on the um, implement of Python, um, more like a client. Uh, library 
to access the uh, HPC interface, uh, IPA instance, and are otherwise on the load books to demonstrate how to use the IPI library to access the IPI. <laughs> Eventually, they reach the HPC. So um, I think, uh, go ahead, just play the video, and that's already include all my slides. Thanks. This is the final demo for two deliverables, D182 Python package to access the HPC API and D183 Demo Jupyter Notebooks. Both have been completed by a GMU team, including Dr. D, Dr. Lin, and Dr. Yu. Forget grainy maps. HPGC is a superpowered lens, revealing Earth's hidden depths, weather patterns dancing in massive datasets, buried resources whispering their locations, and future storms plotted with life-saving detail. This isn't just science fiction. HPGC's parallel processing muscles across millions of cores simulate hurricanes raging in virtual oceans and reconstruct Earth's ancient mantle, unlocking earthquake mysteries. With HPGC, we can navigate the future, predict floods, optimize cities, and build resilience against disasters, unlock hidden treasures, discover resources, manage ecosystems, and understand climate change, protect our planet, monitor deforestation, track invasive species, and make informed environmental decisions. But taming this data beast has its challenges. We need simpler tools, powerful infrastructure, and smarter algorithms to keep up with Earth's ever-changing story. This is where HPGC API comes in. We're building a standard HPGC API to empower scientists, unlocking the Earth's secrets one code line at a time. Harnessing HPC for geospatial analysis just got easier. CyberGIS Compute streamlines the entire process, data, job submission, monitoring, analysis, all in one powerful platform. See it in action. Submit jobs from Jupyter Notebooks, Python scripts, even bash commands. CyberGIS Compute handles the complexities, delivering results seamlessly. We're reviewing it to pave the way for an even more open, standardized HPGC API. We're tapping into the power of OGC API processes, a RESTful API designed for managing geospatial processes. It's the perfect starting point for our HPGC API offering. Streamline Drew functionality, deploy, replace, and undeploy processes with ease. Open API 3.0 compatibility, generate stubs and models for seamless integration. Solid evolution from the web processing service, building on a proven foundation. Imagine a bridge connecting you to the vast realm of high-performance geospatial computing. That's precisely what our HPGC Python client library offers. Let's dive into its creation, capabilities, and challenges. Crafting the client, we leverage the OpenAPI generator to create models and stubs from the HPGC API's OpenAPI specification. Python was chosen as the implementation language, ensuring wide accessibility. The library is available on Pippi as GMU HPGC API, ready for your projects. Key features, exploration, get a comprehensive overview of available processes. Conformance information and API definitions. Process interaction, describe, deploy, replace, undeploy, and execute processes. Job management, monitor job status, retrieve results, and even cancel executions if needed. Challenges and solutions, generation process, errors in specification documents and generator limitations required manual corrections and iterations. Code completeness, to ensure idiomatic Python and handle potential errors, we're exploring tools like TypeGuard and Pydantic for validation and enhancement. Compatibility, we're actively testing with different Python versions and considering alternative tools for better maintenance. Open API and OGC API development. We're employing validation tools and contributing to specification development to address misalignments and promote better compatibility. Complex workflows. Additional code and careful review might be necessary for intricate use cases. Customization. We're investigating tools like TypeGuard and Pydantic, as well as specialized code generation. To offer more flexibility, human review, it's essential to carefully review generated code and test thoroughly to ensure quality and catch any potential issues. By acknowledging these challenges and actively seeking solutions, we're committed to building a robust and user-friendly HPGC Python client library that empowers the geospatial community to harness HPC's full potential. Ready to dive into HPC's power? 
we've got two notebooks to guide you. First up, Demystifying HPC for Scientists, your open access gateway to unleashing asynchronous power with Python and a simple echo process. Build a solid HPGC API foundation without restrictions. Next on the journey, Unleashing HPC for Geospatial Scientists, a restricted dive into complex geospatial workflows on HPC systems. Harness the full potential of HPGC API for real-world tasks. Let's start our exploration with notebook number one. Ready to explore the HPGC notebook? Now, we embark on a thrilling expedition into the uncharted terrain of high-performance computing, HPC. Our trusty steed, Python, paired with the mighty HPGC API. Our Rosetta Stone for unlocking the boundless potential of asynchronous processing. But fear not, novice navigators. We'll begin our journey on familiar ground. Using the playful echo process as our trusty lantern. Think of it as a digital echo chamber, faithfully reflecting your data back to you in the vast HPC wilderness. Through its journey, we'll illuminate the hidden pathways of the HPGC ecosystem, empowering you to conquer even the most intricate scientific computations. Stage 1. Gearing up for the quest. 1. Forging our tools. We'll equip ourselves with the HPGC Python client library, our sturdy pickaxe for carving through the digital bedrock. It grants us access to the HPGC API's hidden mechanisms and lets us wield its computational power with ease. 2. Finding our way, we'll navigate the HPGC API's landing page. A celestial map pointing towards the available processes and documentation. Like seasoned cartographers, we'll study its details. Ensuring compatibility and charting our course through the uncharted territories. 3. Ensuring precision, we'll scrutinize the API's conformance details, the compass needle of standardization. This ensures consistent operation and smooth sailing across different HPC platforms. Stage 2. Plotting the course. 1. Exploring the process bazaar. Enter the process collection. A bustling marketplace brimming with diverse computational tools at our disposal. Each process, like a unique map, outlines its capabilities and input requirements. Imagine traversing through forests of image processing algorithms, scaling peaks of statistical analysis, and delving into deep caves of numerical simulations. 2. Deciphering the echo map. We'll delve deeper, scrutinizing the echo process itself. We'll examine its input and output schemas, the blueprints for our data. Ensuring our exploration remains within the bounds of its capabilities. 3. Preparing our provisions. Armed with this knowledge, we'll craft our input data. The compass needle guiding the echo process towards its destination. Like packing rations for a long journey, we'll ensure our data is formatted correctly and meets the process's expectations. Stage 3. Launching into the unknown. 1. Unleashing the HPC beast. Time to unleash the HPC beast. We'll submit our carefully prepared request. Choosing one of two paths to follow the unfolding adventure. O oh, active monitoring. Like a vigilant scout, we'll employ job objects. Constantly checking the process's progress and retrieving results when the journey concludes. We'll witness the inner workings of the echo process firsthand. Like watching a skilled craftsman at work. O oh, passive monitoring. We'll set up callback services, our loyal messengers sending out smoke signals for success, failure, or even progress updates. This frees us to explore other territories while the echo process runs in the background, its results awaiting our return. Stage 4. Claiming the treasure. 1. Reaping the rewards. The moment of truth arrives. We'll retrieve the echo process's output, the fruits of our asynchronous labor. Depending on our chosen path, we'll either directly access the results with job objects or follow the trail of callback notifications leading to the final treasure. Imagine the thrill of discovering new insights hidden within the data, just like explorers unearthing ancient riches. Beyond the echo, remember, this echo process is just the tip of the iceberg. The HPGC API empowers us to tackle far more complex explorations. Imagine simulations unfolding in the background, data analyses whispering their secrets through callbacks, and intricate calculations completed while you attend to other tasks. Embrace the asynchronous paradigm, letting HPC work its magic while you continue your research. Embracing the adventure. 1. Your personal map. This notebook is your map, guiding you through the HPGC API's intricacies. Adapt the framework to conquer your own scientific Everest, tailoring it to your specific needs and objectives. 2. No peak too high, no matter your computational challenge. 
Whether it's scaling the peaks of climate modeling or delving into the depths of genetic analysis, the HPGC API provides the tools and flexibility to navigate the terrain. 3. Asynchronous Freedom Embrace the asynchronous paradigm. Let HPC work its magic while you continue your research, freeing your mind to explore new ideas and possibilities. So, want to find out more? Go and download the HPGC API notebooks from GitHub and test it out in a Jupyter Notebook environment. Ready to witness HPGC in action? Notebook 2, Unleashing HPC for Geospatial Scientists, showcases a real-world geospatial workflow from start to finish. We'll navigate every step. Authorize clients, deploy processes, submit image algebra jobs, retrieve and visualize results geospatially, calculate Landsat band ratios effortlessly all powered by the HPGC Python client. Library. Watch HPGC mastery unfold before your eyes. Ready to delve into a more advanced HPGC task? Now, we embark on a thrilling quest, harnessing the immense power of high-performance computing, HPC, to unlock the secrets of our planet. Buckle up, for our journey through this Python and HPGC API-powered notebook promises breathtaking insights and groundbreaking discoveries in the realm of geospatial science. 1. Unlocking the Vault Secure access with OpenID Before we delve into the heart of HPC, we must first secure access to its hidden treasures. Fear not, for OpenID authentication acts as our golden key. Imagine bypassing cumbersome individual passwords and seamlessly accessing countless HPC platforms with a single token, crafted through simple steps in this notebook. OpenID is our passport to a world of computational power, a gateway to boundless possibilities. 2. Shaping our arsenal. Dynamic process management within this realm, we forge our tools. Specialized processes designed to tackle specific tasks. Drew, deploy, replace, undeploy, operations empower us to curate our arsenal with precision. We can deploy new tools, like the versatile band math for manipulating satellite imagery. Need to refine an existing tool? Replace it with an improved version, sharpening our edge. And when a tool is no longer needed, we can undeploy it, keeping our workshop efficient and uncluttered. Drew grants us mastery over our computational environment, transforming us into architects of our scientific pursuits. 3. Unleashing the power, band math in action. Now, let's wield the mighty band math tool. We'll deploy it if necessary, transforming our workshop into a dedicated image processing station. Then, we'll feed it raw data, like spectral bands brimming with hidden information. With a swift command, band math will unleash its magic, calculating ratios and indices. Revealing hidden patterns like a secret map unveiled. Witness the raw power of HPC as it alchemizes data into dazzling discoveries, reshaping our understanding of the world around us. 4. Vigilant Guardians, monitoring the process but our work isn't over yet. Like Vigilant Guardians, we must monitor bandmath's progress. Through active monitoring, we can peer directly into the process, observing its calculations unfold like a skilled artisan at work. Alternatively, we can set up a system of passive alerts. Receiving notifications of completion or any unexpected twists. With constant awareness, we ensure our computational journey stays on track, navigating towards groundbreaking discoveries. 5. Unveiling the treasures, visualization and analysis Finally, the moment of truth arrives. The process data now stands before us, a treasure chest overflowing with insights. We'll wield powerful visualization tools, transforming these numbers into vibrant maps, stunning graphs, and captivating imagery, painting a vivid picture of our discoveries. Machine learning will delve deeper, extracting hidden patterns and relationships, turning raw data into knowledge that can reshape our understanding of our planet. This is the true power of HPC, unlocking the secrets hidden within our data and transforming them into powerful tools for science and beyond. Remember, this is just the beginning of our adventure. With each step through this notebook, we hone our skills, unlocking the potential for groundbreaking discoveries. So, let's forge ahead, fellow explorers. The world of geospatial data awaits. Brimming with untold possibilities, let's harness the power of HPC and embark on a journey of scientific exploration, one code line at a time. Today, we unlock the hidden power of HPC with the HPGC API. Think of it as a magical key, opening doors to vast computational resources. Three triumphs stand tall, HPC simplified. No more platform juggling, just a unified interface for your HPC needs. Think one ring to rule them all.
Python Prowess, a dedicated Python library makes commanding HPCA breeze. Install, import, and conquer. Interactive learning, notebooks guide you step by step, revealing the API's secrets one line of code at a time. But, like any epic quest, challenges emerge, standards in flux. The API evolves, demanding adaptable heroes like you. Learning curve awaits. Mastering the library takes time, but every step unlocks new power. Scenarios limited, we're expanding the map. But new paths need exploring. Fear not, fellow explorers. These limitations are mere bumps on the road to HPC mastery. Embrace the journey, delve into the notebooks, and together, we'll chart a course for groundbreaking discoveries. I really enjoyed the storyline. Uh, thank you, Eugene. It was engaging and imaginative. Okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions or um, the questions, please put them in the questions box. Uh, our uh, basically panelists will try to answer your questions. So, Furkan, are you here? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I yes, I can hear you very well. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, yeah, everyone. Furkan. Go ahead. Should I go ahead? Okay. Yes, please. Sure. Hi everyone, great. Uh, hope you're enjoying the presentation of HPGC API. I'm a research programmer at the CyberGIS Center at University of Illinois, Bana Champaign, and we are leading the iGUIDE project. Uh, before moving forward, I really want to thank uh, OGC, GeoLabs, and GM, GMU, uh, who, are the, who are the participant in the uh, HPGC API task. Um, so uh, we, uh, I'm representing iGUIDE, uh, and iGUIDE is a collaboration of multidisciplinary team of 11 U.S. organizations. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? Yeah, so just a brief introduction about iGUIDE. Like I said, it's a multidisciplinary team of U.S. organizations, and the focus of uh, iGUIDE is uh, geospatial data on demand and create a missing middleware uh, between geospatial practitioners, geospatial data, and computation networks. So that's the overall, I would say, very high level overview of what iGUIDE is and uh, what we are trying to do uh, at iGUIDE. So this, um, this keeping this focus and goal in mind, this perfectly aligned with what we are trying to do at, uh, at OGC for this Testbed 19 HPGC task. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I won't go into the technical details. You've already heard about uh, the progress that we have made from uh, uh, Gerald and Eugene uh, over the past nine months or so. Uh, so I would just go through briefly about uh, the overall lessons that we have learned uh, throughout this process. Um, so let me just try to be very like uh, very blunt about it, that this work that it, that you just witnessed and that uh, that was just presented is just a very first step. It's a very it's at a very initial stage uh, and work to formally define HPGC uh, because like you this is a new term. I uh, I'm not sure like I don't think any one of you may have heard HPGC before. Uh, but this was derived from the HPC specific uh, for the geospatial workloads. But at the same time, we wanted to formally define HPGC, but at the same time, we wanted to differentiate between HPC and HPGC as well. And this is, like I said, on the non-technical level, before delving into the technical, uh, technical domain, uh, we wanted to identify whether HPGC overlaps with HPC, whether it is a sub-branch of HPC or how much of uh, the things that it inherited from uh, the HPC uh, paradigm. So we had a lot of discussions, like I mentioned, this is still a work in progress. Um, so in addition to these technical uh, development that we just witnessed, we had these like uh, very basic discussions. And what we like came to the, um, 
uh, what like the lesson that we learned is we have to take a step back and in addition to technical work uh, much else is also needed uh, in terms of identify the key key stakeholders of HPVC uh, paradigm. Uh, at, at the same time, uh, we have to identify the users and end users and developers of the HPVC uh, environment. Uh, like again, so moving HPVC is just one aspect of the bigger picture. Uh, at the same time. Uh, we have to uh, like HPGC just presents, uh, like I mentioned, the computation aspect and how things will run. But at the same time, in the geospatial algorithm and workflows, <clears throat> they need to be optimized for parallel processing as well. Uh, so this HPGC is, like I mentioned, is just one end where we try to bridge the gap between the resources and the developers. But then at the same time, the algorithm themselves and the workflows themselves. This does not focus on that, but a lot of work needs to be done on that uh, part as well, where geospatial algorithms, they themselves need to be optimized for parallel processing. Because traditional parallelization techniques may or may not be useful for geospatial data sets uh, and workflows. So we have a lot of work to be uh, done uh, in that area as well. And finally, um, I cannot emphasize this particular point because we kept on coming uh, over and over again uh, to this point where uh, we where we we identified or we thought that there is a need for decoupling data from the computation because HP, the HPGC focus only on the computation aspect. Like and uh, we have to we have to think like uh, traditionally like I said uh, uh, earlier as well, HPC and traditionally more, mostly focus on uh, the computation part. But does HPGC focus only on the computation, or is there any other relevance to data as well? So obviously there is, but then we have to identify, and there is a lot of uh, uh, work that needs to be uh, done on how this decoupling needs to be done. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, so from those very basic lessons that I just mentioned, uh, some of the future directions that we are thinking uh, are like we have uh, from technical end, we have a tech, uh, we have uh, an, a very basic skeleton of an HPGC API. Now we want to engage developers and we want to engage practitioners as well to build end-to-end -end systems based on this api there was a uh, cyber gs compute uh, uh, mentioned in uh, in the presentation as well so this is again cyber gs compute is one such systems uh, that we at uh, the cyber gs center at uiuc we have developed but that's not uh, like we, that can be taken as the basis for creating <clears throat> and moving on to create uh, HPGC standards uh, for for, uh, for OGC, from OGC. Another direction is HPGC resource management. Like I mentioned earlier as well, just traditional HPC systems mostly focus on the computation aspect. Uh, however, recently with the advent of uh, like big data and data itself, uh, uh, there is a lot of focus that needs to be, that has shifted towards or that needs some, uh, like not some, but a lot of work in the data domain as well. So if we can come up with interesting ways to handle data management for HPGC, that will not just benefit only the geospatial community, but uh, we assume that this will also be very relevant to HPC community in general as well. Uh, but another, like uh, uh, like uh, like I mentioned, one of the lessons learned as well that the algorithms and uh, workflows, a uh, geospatial algorithm and workflow, they need to be optimized. So one very concrete example of this is um, uh, is coming up with in geospatial indexing and partitioning specifically for HPC uh, environments. And we can learn a lot from the distributed geospatial community where they have developed these distributed indexing and dist distributed partitioning. So these uh, standards and uh, not standard, but these mechanism and methods that have been developed from the geospatial distributed community 
they may or they may not be useful for uh, the HPGC uh, environment. Uh, and we, like in the very near future, we are anticipating that we should explore this and we are, we are going to explore this further. And finally, uh, the big geospatial data handling, all of this, if we want to uh, conclude all of this is in one, uh, I would say one terminology or one phrase that would be coupling uh, or combining the HPGC with the big, big geospatial data. Uh, so yeah, that's all from my end for the lesson learned through this HPGC task at the test 19 and some future directions that we can uh, definitely work on. Thank you. Thank you, Farkhan. Uh, yeah, with this, I think the uh, the last uh, task of the testbed 19 is uh, basically presented as well. Uh, there, there are one, some... One question. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yes, there are some questions that needs to be answered. So maybe, Greg, uh, take away. Uh, well, the only question I see right now that really hasn't been addressed is... Uh, uh, HPGC demo does not mention the SPAC system. Should it? SPAC? Our panelists? Eugene, Gerald, Furkan, you, got, you guys are muted. Uh, I'm not sure to get the question. Brian, I'm going to unmute you if you want to just ask, uh, give a little more context to your question. Maybe we'll be able to ask. Oh, I know Mike. Yes, he can. He has no mic. <laughs> okay, so I guess we're we're not going to do that. Um, okay, he says he'll follow up. So, um, like, the, I'm not very familiar personally, like, uh, with the SPAC environment. But as far as I understand, and correct me if I, I'm wrong, this is more like uh, uh, for package management and installation. Is this, am I correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so uh, that's definitely uh, like, uh, there are many ways to do it. We like for instance, for right now, this is uh, like the very initial, very initial uh, package is available on PyPy and definitely that can be it's like uh, making it available on SPAC. It can be uh, like it def definitely can be added to our list of things to do. <laughs> Yes, thanks. And thanks, Brian, for giving them a more a longer list of things to do. <laughs> Any other questions um, before we end today? I'd like to thank uh, Sina and Josh for the good support that you guys have had for us uh, during the testbed as architects, but more importantly, I'd like to thank the sponsors and the participants for all the work and effort they put in. So um, I think it's been successful so far, from documents to publish and some things to wrap up, but uh, it's been a good, a good uh, project so far. I guess I'll put mine back on so we can all be there. Um, with that, I any, any last comments, Josh or Sina? Yeah, I'd like to extend my uh, thanks as well, <clears throat> and also remind people that uh, this is only one stop in the journey, and uh, Testbed 20 is uh, just around the corner. So please uh, become engaged, uh, helping to sponsor it, helping to execute it, uh, or expressing your interest in uh, what it might investigate. So keep us in the loop. Seen anything from you? Yeah, all all the things that Josh and you said. So 
thank you and uh, thank you the participants and the folks that takes take took their time and attended this uh, two day event, uh, two day marathon. So uh, yeah, it was great uh, presenting these information to you guys and listening to lots of new stuff. Thank yeah, you. It, uh, yeah, as the videos get processed, um, hopefully by the end of today, uh, we'll be able to send out, it might be tomorrow before uh, we send out the uh, links to the to the recording. So if you miss something, you can get it. Um, I'd also recommend uh, everybody to visit ogcmeet.org because our upcoming meeting in Delft at the end of March uh, is coming quickly. So. Uh, the agenda's up there. Uh, it's pretty full already. Well, it's totally full already. Um, so no slots are open yet. Um, but uh, it's there for you. And uh, look forward to seeing you guys either uh, at that meeting or and Testbed 20. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you all soon.